Tampa this morning and here this afternoon. <laughs> well, thank you all and thank Frank Ferenkoff and Keith Brown for all that you've done. And uh, I'm just, I heard you were in town and I'm delighted that we could get together again. <laughs> I guess the scheduling office knows that I always like to stop by and see the Eagles and not just because you're a great company, but because I'm ever mindful of the long way that we've come together. I know some of you can remember when the Eagles were founded just after Watergate and back in the grim days of the 70s when our party was broke and our candidates were losing and our political opponents were squeezing every last bit of advantage from our troubles. They weren't just winning elections that in ordinary times Republicans would have been winning. They were also ramming through the Congress one massive spending program after another while all but ignoring the traditional and constitutional duties of government, especially that duty outlined in the preamble of the Constitution, providing for the common defense, protecting the American people from those at home who prey on the innocent and those abroad who would extinguish the light of freedom. So for a while there, it seemed as if the only national agenda was that of a liberal one. And as Bill Buckley used to say, liberals aren't really so much resistant to other points of view as they are astonished to find out there are other points of view. <laughs> well, that's why during those years of Republican decline, the heady wine of easy victory made our political opponents think the American people actually bought a political philosophy that advocated a huge centralized government strong enough to stagnate the economy and tax our citizens into servitude, but too weak to defend the cause of American freedom. And you know what's happened to the liberals since then reminds me of a Navy man that my friend Don Rumsfeld sometimes talks about. It seems this career officer finally got his fourth stripe, became a captain, and took over command of a giant battleship. One night, he's out steaming around the Atlantic, and he was called from his quarters to the bridge and told about a signal light that was in the distance. And the captain told the signal yeoman, signal them to bear starboard. And back came the signal from ahead saying, bear starboard yourself. Well, as I say, the captain was very aware that he was commander of a battleship, the biggest thing afloat, pride of the fleet, and he said, signal that light again to bear starboard now. And sure enough, back came the signal, bear starboard yourself. So the captain, determined to give his counterpart a lesson in seagoing humility, ordered, signal again and tell them to bear starboard, I am a battleship. And back came the signal, steer starboard, steer starboard yourself, I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> Well, uh, the liberals, I think, forgot that the American people turned out to be just what our forefathers anticipated they would be when they made them the final arbiter of political power, a lighthouse of common sense and good judgment. And that's why in the last few years, the people have been reminding our leaders who's really in charge by signaling them to bear starboard. You realize, if you're not nautical, of course, that starboard means to the right. <laughs> now, there are two things that need to be said about this. First, under our political system, most Americans can go about their daily lives without becoming political activists or ideologues. And that's why they needn't expect real leadership in public life. Leadership that sends out clear messages and offers straightforward choices. And that's what, where you've come in because you've made all the difference. The hard work and generosity of the Eagles has provided us with the means to send out those messages and to offer those choices. All of you have been successful in private life, but you've chosen to go beyond that and to give something back to America. Well, you've helped put American political life back on an even keel, and for that, every American is in your debt. But the second point that needs to be made is this. The voyage isn't over. 
We've solved a lot of the problems left to us by years of misgovernment, but since my first day in office, I've always thought that accomplishing this would be just the beginning. Now the real work begins, and we have the chance to put into place reforms that will prevent many of those abuses of government from ever again being a burden to future generations. By the way, the staff around here has been saying, they don't know now I know this, but I have my spies. <laughs> uh, they've been saying that I've been on something of a tear since getting back from California. Well, you can't blame me, can you? I think of what we can achieve this year. Reform a tax system so unfair and so bizarre in its intricacy, it's become a festering sore of distrust and unhappiness among the people. Pass a constitutional amendment that will eventually ensure a balanced budget. Keep the economy growing. Keep bringing down unemployment. And the number of those in poverty and both of those things have just recently happened. Strengthen respect for the values of a people, people who believe that we are a nation under God with a sacred responsibility to protect innocent human life, step up the war on drug abuse and organized crime, finish rebuilding our defenses, and yes, move ahead with foreign initiatives that will not just keep the peace but extend the borders of freedom. So believe me, these are the crucial days. And yes, I'm grateful for all that you've done in the past, but now that we have the chance, now that we know the American people are with us, join me in leaving America and the world a legacy of prosperity and freedom that future generations will honor and thank us for. Please don't just keep up your tremendous work. Redouble your efforts. Make the eagles even bigger and better than they are now, and in return, I promise you every last bit of energy and effort that I can muster. A New England preacher said in the last century, there are seasons in human affairs of inward and outward revolution, when new depths seem to be broken up in the soul, when new wants are unfolded in multitudes, and a new and undefined good is thirsted for. There are periods when to dare is the highest wisdom. Well, we live at such a moment now. Let us dare. Let us dare together, and let us dare for greatness. You know, it's so easy to be here in the White House, all of us, and I include myself, and think, well, we've achieved this. But when you stop and think back, that for all but four of the last about, well, about 48 of the 42 years, or 47, they have controlled both houses of the United States Congress. Now, for five years, we've managed to control one house, the Senate, and we couldn't have done anything that we've done if we hadn't had that one house. But isn't it time now that in addition to putting some one in the executive branch here, that we have a chance to find out what it would be like if Republican philosophy and Republican principles were being executed by the entire government as they have for more than 40 years by our opponents. So we've got a job to do ahead of us, and let's get it back. So thank you all. God bless you all. I'm pleased to have you here and to see you here again. Thank you. I can't. This isn't an encore or anything, but he just reminded me. He's from Sterling, Illinois. I'm from Dixon, Illinois. Playing football in high school, we hated each other. <laughs> and now just look. If we can get together on this, we ought to be able to find all kinds of people that can get together. <laughs> Thank you.